Hey, thanks for joining us today. Here in our channel, you can catch all of our messages and live services. And our hope is that you would experience the presence of God in a very real and tangible way. That's right. And if you want to make sure that you never miss a message again, all you need to do is hit the subscribe button below this video. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, good morning, church. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad that you are here to worship here at Crossroads. Um, if you're new or newer to Crossroads, maybe this is your first Sunday, we're in the middle of a message series right now where we are um, kind of diving into our roots. Um, we are a vineyard church, um, vineyard movement that's been around for the past, oh, um, all, I guess 40 years or so, and, um, and, and this movement that we're a part of, this association of churches, about 550 churches in the U.S., over 2,000 globally, um, really has uh, implanted so much in mine and Joel's hearts, um, and, and so much of what you experience here at Crossroads is vineyard. Even though we don't have vineyard in our name, um, th it's j there, there is an essence of what it means to be a vineyard church. And so we thought it would be really important over these past couple of weeks, um, we have this series called We Are Vineyard. And um, so we're bringing in some of our mentors, spiritual mothers and fathers, people who have really influenced our lives, and we just want to share them with you. So in just a moment, we're going to have John Elmer come up, and I have a couple more things to say about him before he does. But before we do that, I want to uh, personally invite you, if you have not already registered for this coming Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., we have a Come Holy Spirit conference. And yes, we're super excited about this. We have, again, one of the OGs of the vineyard, Steve Nicholson, is coming. And I'm just telling you guys, like, like Steve is, like, one of our favorite people. But he is, I'm just telling you, he is anointed. The Holy Spirit moves through him in powerful ways. If you're curious about the Holy Spirit, if you want to know more, if you want to dive in, learn how to pray for people, learn, learn how to, uh, you know, experience a naturally supernatural um, power of God, you need to be here on Saturday. So um, you can get on our website, on the app. You can sign up uh, out at Crossroads Central. But we do need you to register by Wednesday because we do have, you know, we're trying to get our seating arranged and, and all the materials. We want to make sure that we're set up for everybody. So please do register by this Wednesday um, so we can get a good count of who's going to be here. We, we actually have opened this up. We have people from town coming in, like, that don't go to Crossroads. We have uh, other vineyard churches that are going to be joining us. Um, so it's going to be a really, really um, great time together. Um, please make plans. You will not regret it. I promise you that. So we'll see you this Saturday. Steve Nicholson will be here with us. All right. Well, I'm going to have John come on up. John is, uh, he actually, this is, this is actually a really momentous day. Um, John um, just handed his church over. He, he's pastor. He, he planted uh, the Syracuse Vineyard um, back 31 years ago, and he just handed it over to, um, you know, a new pastor. And uh, he has served faithfully for many, many years in the vineyard. He is a vineyard father. He is a spiritual father to Joel and I. He is a dear, dear friend to uh, Joel and I as well. Um, Little side story, some of you guys have heard this, but, um, you know, back in the, the late 90s, I was a very broken 20-something. Uh, just, I, I was in a really dark place, and um, I was up in Syracuse visiting some of my family, and I just happened to end up at a vineyard church, John's church. Many, we didn't even meet. I didn't even meet him that day. Uh, but I will tell you that that experience at, at the Syracuse Vineyard was, a, was literally uh, life-changing. It was a paradigm shift for me. Just I, I walked out of church that day say, uh, thinking, this is what church should be like. Because I saw, you know, uh, first of all, their bulletin said, come as you are and be loved. And I saw this at work. You know, there's like a bunch of guys smoking outside of the front door and you know you come in there's like all these like rocker dudes that are on the worship team and and like you just you saw everybody everybody that came was so 
uh, much a part of the family, and it didn't matter what, what they came from or how they looked. They were all loved well, and I felt so loved that day. Who would have thought ever, um, you know, 25 years later that I'd be standing next to John on the national team of the vineyard, <laughs> and we're both on the national team together, and um, I, I just, you, you think, uh, one thing that, that I was even thinking as I was recalling the story is you just never know who's sitting in your service, you know, coming in broken, coming in wounded, like not having any hope at all, and then look, look what can happen in 25 years. So anyway, would you guys give a big, warm welcome to John Elmer. Well, thank you. It is, it is an honor to be here. I, um, I, Joe and Christina, you guys have a big part of my life, and uh, I, I don't know if you realize this, but they are highly uh, respected throughout the Vineyard Movement. Like, this church is. It's, it's known as a, a place where there's uh, creative energy to, to, you know, make ways that people can hear the Word of God and experience the presence of Jesus. That They've done an incredible job, and they're just super people. I mean, I just love hanging out with them. I'm always energized at their hanging around with these guys. Give, give them a, a round of applause, because I don't think you understand how, how beloved they are around. And um, well, today I, I want to talk about uh, the idea everybody gets to play. Now, most people want to get in the game, right? Like, it's more fun playing than sitting watching. Whoever sits and watches a board game, right? You, you want a piece and some dice to start playing, right? And, and it's, it, everybody wants to get in the game and play and experience it. You know, uh, for years, I coached uh, under seven soccer. Because when my kids were growing up, I said, well, I'll just do that. And if you've ever been around a group of five and six-year-olds, they just like are everywhere. And everybody wants to get in the game. Everybody wants to be playing. No one wants to sit on the bench and you know I'd say okay who wants to go and every hand would come up and they'd be running you know literally pulling on my shirt put me in coach put me in coach it, it was crazy and, and in, in that league you had to let everybody play roughly equal which was everybody wanted to play all the time so I would you know start a first team and then you know you'd put in the second team and it was supposed to be non-competitive but every kid kept score if you ever kids like I know there's no one it doesn't matter if you're winning you know, oh, we lost 7-1 dad I, I I know you know you know and so every kid always wanted to get in except for this one year I had this little girl her name was Jess and she was cute as can be and she always came early for practice. She was there. She was enthusiastic. She just loved being a part of the team and around it. And, you know, she was one of the last ones to leave always. I mean, she just loved being a part of the team. First game, we get in. She wasn't very good at all, really. So we, we put the first team in, and they played. And it came for the second team, and I'm putting people in. And I'm like, Jess, you need to come in. And she looks at me. She's, on the, she's sitting over on the bench, and she's playing this, like, clapping game with her friend. And she looks at me, and I said, Jess, you got to come in. She goes, no, and, and, and starts playing some more. And I'm like, well, Jess, no. I go over. I go, Jess, you got to go in. The game started. I go, you got to go in. Everybody has to play. And she goes, no, I'm playing here. I like this. And, and I'm going, Jess, your dad's going to be really mad at me. You got to go in. No. And she just stayed there and playing her clapping game. Sure enough, at halftime, her dad comes steaming over like, why didn't Jess play? I said, she played the whole time, but she wanted to play on the bench. That was her game, the clapping game. So everybody wants to play. It may be something different that they want to play at. You know, in the, in the vineyard, we have this long-held value that everybody gets to play. It's not just the, the man of God up front. It's not just the... The, the most educated, the most, you know, uh, long-standing. Everybody gets to play. The, the, the new and the experienced, the young and the old, men and women, you know, the broken and the scarred, the, the, the not so sure and the overconfident. That everybody is called into the game to play. Each one of us is called into the game. Now, why is that? 
Well, I think it's a, a biblical principle. See, my first point is this. We've all been made to play. Let me um, read you something. This is where it gets tricky with a handheld to hold your Bible. So how do you do? You put it in your pocket? <laughs> that free works pretty good, doesn't it? Look at that. There you go. Man, I love this. I'm not going to do this, but I just want to do it for a moment. You know? You, you thought you guys were the creative ones. Look at that. I want to read a passage it's from Genesis. And it gives us a glimpse of what actually happened. How God put the street. See, Genesis is a great book because you can learn so much. There's so many principles being set in Genesis. And so there, this is one of the big ones, I think. And we get this glimpse of what he's doing. So, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So he created us in his image, in his likeness. Like, we're a reflection of, of who he is. I mean, think about that, right? I mean, who is God? I mean, he, 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 has, he, he has this great wisdom. He has great love. He's put in us this, this ability to, to reason. He's put in us, humans, uniquely, this ability to love, to, to make choices. He's given us free will. He's invested so much in us to, to be like him. And, and one of those things that put us in his image is he is a creator. That he, he proactively begins things and starts things and builds things. He's a doer. That we serve a God who literally his hands are dirty. Because he, he's, he's made that way. He, he moves out of himself. You know, think of Jesus, right? He's at the creation. He, he's the one that, that, that pours out manna to his people. And when Jesus walked this earth, he was washing feet. He was healing people. He was the key architect and player in the redemptive story. He does things. He's in the game. And some gods, you hear about people talking about their gods and they're distant and just sitting on a throne, angry. But this is an act of doing God. It goes on to say, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The first command, really the first time God is speaking to his creation, the scriptures tell us, he says, get in the game. Do something. Begin to, to I, I made this whole creation, begin to engage it and, 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 and reflect what I have for it. Build on what I've made. Make a difference. You know, he blessed them as he did this. And this just isn't, a, you know, the one place. It's all over the scriptures. It's, it's in the New Testament. One of my favorite verses is Paul talking at church to the Ephesians. And he says this. And he would say this if he looked you in the eyes right now. For we are all God's handiwork. You think about this, right? Like God is this master's craftsman. He's an incredible artist, a creator, incredible uh, engineer, a builder. And, and we're his, 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 his masterpieces he made. I mean, I kind of envision when God made you and me, he went something like this. He says, man, I got to go take some time in my, my workshop. And so he goes in his incredible workshop and he puts on his you know, leather apron maybe and, 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 and he gets over there and he starts building. Because the Bible tells us that, that he knit us together in our mother's womb. That he, he made you like you are. You're made in an incredible way. You're a masterpiece. And so he's making you, as he's making you, you know, I just imagine when he made me, like he said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to put a little bit, uh, kind of an extrovert personality in this guy. 
and, and you know what, I, I, I think I'm going to have them have, you know, blue eyes. And maybe uh, I'm going to give him a, a little this much height. And then he sneezes phew, and, and blows off some of that dust. He goes, ah, that's all right. You know, I'll get that later. It never does. And he puts all these things into me. He put all the things into you, the unique things that make you you. And he put them all in. And he, he, he must have just held you out for a moment. It's like, oh, oh wow. This is awesome. I did this, I, I, wow. He, he, he opens his door. He goes, hey, quick, you know, Gabriel, come over here. Michael, row your boat over here for a minute. Come here. Right? He says, look at this one. Look at this one. This one, this one's tied for the best one I ever made. Like, this one's awesome. This one's going to be incredible. And they're like, wow, this is, you, you've, you have just outdone yourself. This, this is tied for the best one. You have been created by a master. Then, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. There's something when, when you and I connect with Jesus. And, and if you're here today and haven't yet connected, I'm really glad you're here. But when you connect with Jesus, some of you realize this. It gets supersized. It gets released. It gets empowered in a new way. You become more of what you were created to be, not less. Created in Christ Jesus. To do good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. That there are things that God made you for. When he was putting you together in his workshop, and there was each one of us has this unique gifting, this, this unique uh, way of seeing things, of thinking, of some skills, talents, some history that he made sure got weaved into your life because he has a unique job for you to do. Like you got to do it. The team's missing something if you don't. You've been called. To be in the game and to play. Now, when I talk about that different times at our Syracuse Vineyard, there, a lot of times a question comes up, and some of you may be thinking about this. I'm not really sure what that is. Like, what did God call me to? I'm, I'm just me. And I can't answer that for you right off, but I can give you a clue how to figure it out. I, I got this from a guy named Bill Heibels. He was a big pastor out in the Midwest, and he, um, he coined this phrase, holy discontentment. That I think each one of us, there's something that stirs in our heart that, that, that just we, we kind of get passionate about. Something that you're discontent about the way it is now. For some of you, it may be, you know, the education system. For some of you, it may be that there are people who are, are going to hell that don't know Jesus. It, it could be that, that there's this, this un, injustice in, in, in your community that somebody needs to fix. It, it, it may be that there's hungry people. It may be that people don't know the Bible. It may be that, that there's, there's a lack of community. It's something in you that you see it and you get cranked up, man. Like You're like, this isn't right. Somebody should do something. Now, if you ever hear yourself say that, you found your passion. You found your call. And God's waiting you to be the one who does something. So it's this discontentment that, that other people are going, yeah, that, yeah, that sucks, but so what? And you're like, no, no. Somebody's got this, this is deep discontentment and it's holy discontentment because I believe the Holy Spirit is stirring it in you and you just can't you can't you can't get over it you can't forget it it's like a little stone in your shoe right change the way you walk it's that holy discontentment we're made to play we're made to serve others and, and there's something that God made you for. 
And you know, here's the amazing thing, that it makes us healthier. One thing I love about the Bible <laughs> is it's right. <laughs> like whenever there's research done, it always affirms what the Bible says. Social scientists study, you know, volunteerism a ton. And everything they found agrees with the Bible. That we're made for this. We do better when we're serving other people. Let me just give you some, some, some facts. This is from a Canadian national survey of giving, volunteering, and participating. It was done about 20 years ago. And I know Canada's a long way from here, but, man, I could see it from my backyard. <laughs> Some things. Volunteering, lead, this is what the report uh, stated. Volunteering leads to greater life satisfaction and lower rates of depression. Evidence indicates that volunteering has a positive effect on social, psychological, and emotional factors, such as a personal sense of purpose and accomplishment, and enhances a, personal social, a person's social network to buffer stress and reduce disease risk. You want to stay healthier? Get in the game. Those who volunteer reported higher levels of happiness, life satisfaction, self-esteem, a sense of control over life, and physical health. That's better than getting all the candy and Candy Crush, right? Like, it changes our life because we're made to serve. We're made to be in the game. Researchers have also found that when Patients with chronic or serious illness volunteer. They receive benefits beyond what can be achieved through medical care. It's better than whatever pill you're taking. And, and there's, you know, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> you don't have to go to the pharmacy. U University of Nevada study found, now if you have kids, listen real closely here. Youth who volunteer just one hour or more a week are 50% less likely to abuse alcohol, cigarettes, become pregnant, or engage in other destructive behavior. Youth who volunteer are more likely to do well in school, graduate, and vote. Like, so if you're a parent, and you're like, man, this is hard. Join a ministry team. Be it working in kids' ministry, guests, or host, or worship, or whatever you think maybe is in your kid or is in you. Do it together. It'll change your lives. I mean, you, this uh, for I like this one. I'm going to read it just because I'm an old guy. So if you're an old guy, make note of this. <laughs> Retired men who serve one day a week live two and a half times longer than men who don't. So if you don't like somebody, just tell them to sit on the couch. <laughs> Wow, that's cold, isn't it? <laughs> well, here's my second point. Jesus wants us to impact others. It's just not activity. It's meaningful activity. It's kingdom activity. It's moving and flow what he wants to do and is in doing in our communities, in our lives. We're called to serve our king and, and, and the people he loves. Let me read you something. Here he's, he's talking. He's doing this great training on, um, to his disciples. Like, this is going to even be better than Steve Nicholson. But, but I might come back next week. If you haven't signed up, sign up for Steve Nicholson. I'll tell you, he is incredible. And you will, you will be impacted by the Holy Spirit that weekend. I, 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 I always am when I'm around Steve. But he's teaching his disciples. This is what he'd say to us. He says, you are the salt of the world. That's who you are. If you've connected with Jesus, that means you're to bring flavor in the places. You, salt is a, a preserve, uh, uh, and it, it preserves food from rotting. It preserves food to, 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 so it won't be dying that it can give life. And that's what we're to be. We're to preserve our communities. We're to give flavor to our community. Do you ever eat popcorn without salt? It's like bits of cardboard. Why, why am I doing this? But like salt, you're like, ah, you can't stop, right? Has anybody ever em not emptied their, 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 their popcorn at the movie theater? 
and you feel sick afterwards. But, but salt, man, it brings flavor. You are the light of the world. Now, light illuminates. Light shows the way. Light lets people see. When you and I are called to be salt in life, that means that we have to, to get among people. We need to be doing the stuff we're called to do. That brings the, the, uh, the, the, the preserves. It brings flavor. It enriches a community. It enriches a, a church. It, it enriches a family. That it brings flavor of fun and health and growth. And, and like as we read the statistics, long life. Salt and light impact what it comes in contact with. And when we get in the game, we impact others more than we can even imagine. Let me give you a story. You know, I, I didn't grow up connected with Jesus at all. And it's kind of wild, man, and got lots of trouble and kicked out of this, you know, expelled and suspended and all that. And, and, and um, I had to go to a, a parochial school because I got kicked out of uh, public school. So I, was, I went there as a ninth grader and, um, you know, I was new to school and I was meeting people. There's this one person who, over the next year, I know, she was, she was, uh, she was not cool. She had this big neck brace and, you know, didn't walk well. And she just, you know, was somebody I just didn't notice much. But she, um, I did hear she was doing a Bible study. I said, how weird is that? Like, wow, no wonder she's not cool. Like, yeah. I mean, this is how I was thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of this. But um, my junior year, they, they had this assembly for the whole, all the 11th graders. And because um, it was a Catholic school, they, they were able to do this, you know. And they did it, and they said, we want you guys to hear this story. And her, her name, I, I, I don't even know if I knew her name until that moment. Her name was Maureen, and she, she got up front. And, and, and I thought, something looks different. And I realized, oh, she doesn't have her neck brace. And she started telling, her and her friends are telling a story about how this great life in Jesus. And, and, and she, she said, my friends prayed for me. And as you notice, since I've been in high school, I've always had this neck brace and all these problems, and they prayed for healing. And, and she said, you know, her, her, her legs, you know, were really uneven. And she said the one grew, and, and that's why her back then was healed instantly, and she didn't need the neck brace and all that. And, and it was like, you know, she's telling us a great story. And me being the troublemaker I am and not wanting anything to do with God. So she said, any questions? I said, yeah. I said, can you pray for me so I could be taller? You know, and, 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 you know, just mocking what God did. But underneath, it put something in my mind and in, in, that I couldn't let go of that. Maybe this Jesus thing, there's something real about Jesus. That she was salt and light to me from a distance, a mocking distance. And yet she she it was it was about a year after that. Where I had this this experience with the Holy Spirit and got saved. But this salt and light, when we when we step out, when we get into the game, when we begin to do what God has called us to do. It impacts those around us. Lots of people. And we're made to play. And as we get in, we'll impact people. But, and here's my third point. We will need to step in faith. You see, because it's really easy to sit. It's really easy to be on the couch. It's really easy not to, to do anything. It's a passive, easy way. But it takes faith. It takes courage to step out and say, I'm going to fight that monster. It takes strength to say, I'm going to say no to comfort and more TV time or, you know, eating more nachos or whatever you do. And I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get my hands dirty. I'm, I'm going to take the risk of looking stupid of being silly, of being rejected, being mocked like Maureen was mocked by me. You know, if God's calling you to something, 
my guess is it's bigger than you are. And here's the amazing thing is you step. It seems big, but you step and God does it. And then you step and it's even bigger step. And yet God does it. And what happens is faith and trust grow. And you begin to to take on bigger and bigger giants. But it has to be that first step of faith. You know, when we're doing kingdom work, that is that is moving as as, as the Holy Spirit is leading, you know, bringing kingdom principles. It, it could be teaching. It could be demonstrating. It could be fighting for the oppressed. It could it could be doing all kinds of things. When we're doing kingdom work, we'll need kingdom power. We need the Holy Spirit, his his strength, his wisdom, his his, his anointing. You know, Jesus gave some marching orders to his crew. Let me read you something. He's sending his uh, he's training his disciples, which is you and me. Nobody's nothing special about this crew. And he's giving them this, his, their marching orders, and he says this. He says, heal the sick. Think about that. Somebody's sick. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Raise the dead. Drive out demons. I mean, you can't just do that passively. When you heal the sick, it means you just put yourself in a place to hear the story of somebody being sick. You need to go in their presence. Sometimes that means maybe even getting sick because you're in their presence. It, 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 you need to, in faith, say, let me pray for you. And then invite the power of God. You want to, you know, uh, cleanse those who have leprosy, the, the most dreaded disease of their day. You know, it was like COVID. How many people laid hands on people with COVID two years ago? You're like, see ya. That's a pretty good move, too, wasn't it? I, I still got it. Come on. I'll probably be sore tonight from those two kicks. <laughs> You know, all of us are called to bring this supernatural power to get in the game, uh, to, you know, see what God wants to do and then do it, to sense his heart. And then he says this, freely you have received, freely give. I mean, think of all that God has given you of healing, of uh, his empowerment, of of peace, of, of wise choices. I mean, the spirit working in you, sometimes it seems just natural, and sometimes it's supernatural. He says, you've received that, now give it to others. You're in a blessed spot. Maybe you have a job. So maybe some of your getting in the game is to pay other people's bills. But whatever he's given you, you use that to give to others. Freely you receive, freely give. And that's for all of us. There was, um, when I first planted this church, you know, when you plant a church, you're, you, you do every role, right? I've done every role in our church except for worship lead, and I beg for them to let me do that, but they won't. So if you guys want me to do a song, I'll do a song right now. I swear. You got there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hold on that, though. <laughs> Joel's prayers are just too heavy to not to have me do that. Um, do you want me to dance, though? <laughs> um, where was it? Oh, doing every roll, right. So when we first started, we had some junior high kids. We needed somebody to kind of do something with them. So I was the junior high guy for, for, for a minute there. And um, I remember this one day we were meeting, and we were meeting in front of us. We were kind of gathering people we're going to go do something and we're in front of this house of one of the teens and she'd come out and she said you know, I'm really sick and I, I don't know if I can go I feel like I'm going to throw up and you know her friends or two friends are like oh you got to go you got to go and I said I said well why don't we pray for her do you mind if we pray for you and like three junior high girls and you know, two out of three are like brand new Christians. They're like, he, 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 I don't know. He, he, he. You know, and I said, well, listen, let's do this. I, I, 
you know, will you two just, where's it hurt? She said, this hurts my stomach. I feel like I'm through. Will you two just put your hand right over her stomach and pray? And her, <laughs> we don't know how to, you know, they're, they're giggly nervous. You know what I mean? And, 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 and they said, well, we don't know what to pray. I said, well, just pray what you want Jesus to do for her pain. And so these two junior high kids, it's like, he, he, okay. And, and they said, Jesus, you know, help, help Monique feel better. And you know, Jesus, take the pain away so she can come on this trip with us. You know? and, and that was about their prayer. And I said, okay. I said, you know, how are you feeling? Monique said, I feel better. I feel good. Like she was healed instantly by these two young junior high brand new believers. She, they laid hands on her and they prayed and they were scared. and They were you know, nervous and, and, and yet they did it. They got in the game and their friend then was freed of this this pain. It's stepping into the game. And those two, those three oftentimes now were part of the prayer team when they were growing up. Because they found this, and it was great, and it was exciting. Let me read you one last story. I really got to get smoother with this. this. I'm getting better, but I, I got a long way to go yet. So this happened. Jesus, Jesus was having kind of a rough time in, in, in one way. Like his cousin, John the Baptist, was murdered, and, you know, he had sent out the 12, and they came back, and they had healed all these people, and things were going great for them, and I know he saw something in them. There was a hook, maybe, of pride, and so he wants to bring them out, and he brings them out to a quiet place so he could just chill, and he could coach them, and, and he could probably process his own grief, I'm guessing, and so they go away, but the crowd so much wants Jesus, they figure out where he's going, and they rush there. They basically even beat him there, right? And he goes to where his place is supposed to be quiet, his retreat. And there's this crowd. And it says he had compassion on them. He saw the crowd, had compassion on them. And so he begins to teach them and minister. I imagine him healing people and casting out demons and, and, you know, just loving on this group. And then by the time it was late, I'm picking up the story here. By the time it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him and he said, this is a remote place. And it's it's already late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. You know, they're thinking, OK, crowd management, you know, hey, there ain't no McDonald's here. They better get somewhere because traveling late at night is dangerous. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. He calls them into the game. He invites them to, to fix a solution in a kingdom way. Well, they said to him, well, that'd take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? And so Jesus directs them in this process. Well, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Again, he gives him an assignment. And, you know, the assignment had a little bit of faith to it. Like, think about it. The people maybe recognize that they're with Jesus, like there is in their circle, and they're in the crowd and go, hey, a hungry crowd, hey, who's got some food to eat? Can anybody, you know, score me a loaf of bread? Like, what you got? And so they're trying to, they got to step out in faith and try to get this information assessed, and they come back to Jesus. And they say, um, we found five loaves and two fish. Basically, think about it. I think about it like maybe a, a couple of uh, Subway sandwiches. You know, that's about what they had. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the grass. And so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. Let me stop. Now, I want you to think about this. This mob, and Jesus says, okay, we got a couple of subs. Here's what I want you to do. Set the groups up in a way we can manage them. Give them about 50 to 100. And so, you know, there's Andrew and Nathaniel and Judas and Pete, and, you know, they're like, all right, crowd, 
this massive, massive crowd. Like, okay, you guys, we just need to group you a little bit. Hey, everybody, from, from this side over, just from the guy in the orange tunic, just move over this way. For, and everybody else go this way. People are yelling, why? Why? What are you doing? I don't know. Just do it, okay? It's better. Why is it better? Why do you got to do it? I like this piece of grass. Come on, buddy. Just just move over. Okay. You want to go to the other side? You pick your side, you know? I'm, I'm sure it was like hassling, moving, and they... they they, why are we doing this? They don't even know yet. They just know that Jesus told them to get in the game and do this. This was the part they had to play. So they do all that. So now this group is broken up. And then Jesus, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces of bread and fish. And the number of men who eaten were 5,000. So, you know, women and children, let's say 10,000. And we look at that sometimes. We don't understand what really happened. I mean, think about it, right? Jesus, they got every set. The, the, the gang comes back, and he's got these two subs. And he had them distributed. I want you to think. Now, I know you can ask Pete when you're in heaven, but I, I, this is how I picture it happen. Jesus prayed. He's got the two in front of him, and he's like, God, I trust you, God. You know, do your stuff. And he takes this sub, and he rips a piece off, and he hands it to Andrew and says, okay, Andrew, those groups up there, go feed them. And, and Andrew got this sub and he's walking over and he sees this mob of hungry people and Jesus says go feed them and he's like how do I do this and I don't know if I was in Andrew's sandals at the time I think well maybe I'll just give everybody a little taste and so I go up to the front of that crowd and I, I got this sub. You know, I'm just thinking about half a sub. And I, I just rip off a little corner of it. I say, here. Nah, guy grabs it, you know. And, 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 and I rip off another little piece and I give it here. And so mama grabs it and she gives it to her kid and says, I need more. I got three kids. And, you know, rip off a little piece. But, but then I look at the sub. And this, this half a sub that should be about this big now is still this big. And I see something's up. And so maybe the next guy, who's a big guy, I, I rip off a bigger piece. And I give it to him. And I look down, and the sub's still there. And then suddenly I realize that God is doing something as I've stepped out. And I start ripping off more and bigger pieces and chunks of it. And people are eating. And, and I go back to that first person and say, hey, I didn't give you enough. And I give them more. And I keep giving it. And there's this whole crowd of 50s and hundreds and hundreds of groups of people. And I keep doing it. And I think he's going. And I don't know how, but I know God has called me to do it. And he is working a miracle in front of me. Because why? Because I was willing to step out. I was willing to get in the game. And then thousands of people ate. We had 12 baskets of leftovers. And if I said no, if I said, you know, I'm just going to go take care of myself, or I found a sandwich and I ate it on the side, this doesn't happen. You have been called to get in the game. You have been given gifts. And there is no mistake for you being here in this part of the world at this moment, in the school you're at, at the job you're at, with the family you have, living in the neighborhood you're living in. God puts you there because he has something for you to do. And we need to have the courage and the openness to the power of the Spirit to step out and pray for the sick, to serve the poor, to share our story. To, to, to get on the team and play with all our hearts. Why don't we stand? I want to give you an opportunity 
to say yes. And in a moment, and I'm only going to ask once, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to step out, to step out off the bench, to step into the game. Now, you may be serving some way, but you may have this holy discontentment that is stirring in you. And I don't know what it's around. It may be justice. It may be caring for the poor. It may be evangelism. It may be education. It may be starting a, a, a support group for families with special needs. It may be, you know, uh, getting transportation for refugees. I, I don't know what it might be for you. But I know there's something. And maybe it's church planting. Maybe it's a call in the ministry. I want to ask you, to make a step this morning, symbolic gesture, but I'm going to ask you in a moment to come up here as God is stirring for you to step out in some way. And I want to pray for boldness and power. Because God will give that to you. So if you have something stirring in this holy discontentment area, somewhere you know God's calling you to do, it could be worship, it could be whatever. I want you to come down now and say yes, and I want to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to touch you. Come on down. And I want to thank you for being courageous and doing that. That's a scary thing to say yes. And God will bless that. So let's, let's just pray right now. I thank you, Jesus, for this group who are saying yes to you. I thank you that, that you, have stir, you have made them in a, an incredible, wonderful way. And you have made them for the perfect solution to this problem that is there. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them power and clarity. I pray for insight. I pray that you would give them uh, uh, to, to know how to step out. But I pray you give them boldness, even if they don't know how, that they'll make the move. May the power of God fill your hearts. May the compassion of Jesus stir in you. I pray that you will not be able to, to, to rest until you make this step. That there'll be the, the hand of God on you, pressing you. And I speak against the lies that have said you can't do it. I speak in the name of Jesus against the lies that said you're disqualified. You are not disqualified. You are, you are qualified because of Jesus in you. And so I pray for that, Lord. Fill them. Fill them. And just now in the quietness of your heart, just say, yes, Lord. Yes, I'll do this. Yes, Lord, I, I think there's some of you that you right now you're getting a picture of the first thing you got to do. I think some of you are you're realizing you need to talk to somebody about this. And right now, I want you to make a commitment to Jesus to talk to that person in the next week. Bless them, Lord. Fill them with your presence. And I pray for incredible fruitfulness in what God has called you to do and to be. Amen. God bless you, man. Go for it.